this is New World Review and I'm your host, Grand Line Waifu. I have been threatening to steal your soul and replace it with a beanie for so long that maybe we forget I can be happy and kind and maybe replace your soul with, insert nice thing here. Instead, use those like and dislike buttons and maybe just this time things won't be dark and dangerous. Maybe I won't crawl out from under your bed with a creepy dog wearing a beanie. Instead, I'll walk out of your mirror with a freshly baked pie. Who doesn't like their soul stolen by a pie bearing harpy they can't get away from because they can't move several tons of door. Speaking of several tons of door, let's discuss episodes 23 and 24 of Hunter Hunter. Episode 23. This was a clever episode. It started out very light, very funny, very much on par with what we've seen in the past, while acknowledging that, hey, things were going to get darker. Our heroes got a training montage. We saw everyone level up after the first part of the Hunter exam. In terms of emotional balance, the episode was very well constructed. The silliness of Leorio finding out that the bathroom door was weighted was a great addition, and as the teamwork led to fruitful results, it's interesting to note that Satotz's comment about Gon's arm being stronger than ever when it recovered was definitely true. Either that, or we're going to see Gon struggle with drawing a bow or or something in an episode or two. To the end of the episode. The sudden darkness is, in and of itself, good. The abruptness of the behaviour, the finality of it, the mechanical response, the angles they took, and the art were all beautiful. This is an awkward situation, isn't it? I guess before I get started, we should be clear about something. The Grand Line Waifu cartoon image is brown, and you've seen in photos here, here, and here that I'm a black woman. So I'm going to, by necessity, need to spend some time talking about exactly what happened at the end of episode 23, and the level of trauma I experienced seeing someone who looks like me essentially shot in the head. Here's the thing that we need to remember. I watch episodes one by one. I review one episode before moving on to the next, even within the episodes of this review series. Whether this woman has been killed or disabled for the moment, I don't know. At time of writing the review, because I write before I talk to you about it, I don't know what happened to her. And I'm not going to blunt my response to make it more palatable because frankly, people like me also watch anime. People younger than me who look like me and have similar experiences to me watch anime. That's important. Representation matters. And it's because representation matters more than people realise that this character is incredibly significant in more ways than I can count. I know for a fact that this particular episode review is likely to upset some people. But the point of a review is to give my honest responses and opinions, and if this is where I draw the line, what's the point of reviewing? So, why did they functionally kill the first black woman of the series? The first black femme character. My immediate response to the character on meeting her was, she's badass, amazing, empathetic, beautiful, suave looking. Finding out she was someone Kilwa trusts was a huge red flag that I should have recognised, but to be honest, I was blindsided by the fact that of all the cosplays I've seen of this show, this character who I don't even know the name of is one that I've seen that I could identify with. I looked at her and thought, oh, she looks like me. I really appreciate that they've put in a character like her and that she doesn't seem to have huge flaws that narratively would stem from her racial background. It's nice to see someone who looks like me. It's nice to see a femme in the show. It's nice to see a femme in the show who hasn't been hyper-feminized. But of course, those things are all red flags in this show that I've already discussed. If someone femme doesn't look hyper-femme, if they're not there to be ogled, sexualized, fetishized, or brutalized, it doesn't seem they can be there at all. Simply put, there are things wrong with this series, and the treatment of black people and the treatment of women are two of them. I'm breaking my own rule of getting up on a soapbox, and I know that, but the effect this episode had on me was extreme and needed contextualizing. Because on the one hand, I fully understood why it happened narratively, and on the other, I hated that it had to happen to the first black woman we see in the series. The worst part about it is that I don't see it as particularly dark. It's possible to tell a dark story without engaging racist and sexist tropes. I should know. I write and play in dark stories on almost a daily basis. And I know people will say, well, GL Dub, what do you want? Do you want us not to have any black people in shows at all? Would that make you happy? And the answer to that is, of course not. Why not, instead, have more people of colour appear on screen in the first place so that this particular scene doesn't look like a racially based decision. Because maybe it wasn't. And I get that, but that's what it looked and felt like. And the next response I expect is, this is anime and it's set in a place like Japan. The demographic is largely Asian. But is it? Look at the range of pale skinned people and how they're drawn. Look at the lack of brown people. Think about the styles of music we've had, the cultural elements that have been brought into this show, the flamenco, the jazz. Those are very Western styled elements. And yes, I'm aware that this series is almost 25 years old. The culture then was very different to the culture now. I'm also aware that if I binge the show, I'd probably have a different experience of it. But as I've said before, I review this way because it's the way that I can get the purest response to each individual episode. When it originally aired, it would have been a weekly event. This is my reaction to that weekly experience. And if I were an eight-year-old GL dub watching this when it aired, I'd have had this same response in 1998 spread out over a week until the next episode. So I think 
all these feelings are valid and relevant, but for the sake of those of you hanging in there, I'm going to let go of it for now. As a final note on this episode, it's heartbreaking to me that Kilwa doesn't believe he had a friend in the world. Whoever she is, or was, she's most definitely a friend to him too. For him to be able to even mention he made a friend in such a hostile environment says everything about her character, and I hope we see her again. Cautiously on to episode 24. Canary, of course, survives. I was somewhat aware that she would, though I wasn't sure how. Canary's an important character for many reasons, and that import carries through this episode too. As suspected, she is one of the only characters to be friends with Kilwa, though there's an interesting distinction to be made between those who act as though they're friends with Kilwa and those he sees as friends. Notably, Leorio and Kurapika don't see Kilwa as their friend, rather they see Gon as a friend and therefore want to help Gon help his friend. Canary sees Kilwa as a friend even if he doesn't see her as worthy of him. The poignant thing he here is that the first time Kilwa asks her to be his friend, she declines because she knows his mother is watching. Given Kilwa's heightened awareness of those around him, it seems absurd to believe that Canary saw his mother hiding in the bushes while Kilwa didn't. So we have to assume that Kilwa called her lame for not standing up to his family and being her friend regardless, the way Gon does. As a result, she throws caution to the wind and calls for help for her friend. Is it a consequence of believing she disappointed Kilwa? Kilwa has no way of knowing this situation occurred. He has no way of hearing of Canary's care of him or seeing her eyes soften or any of the things Gon sees and questions. It makes for a lot of interesting watching and it makes her fascinating on another scale. This girl with definite martial abilities who has a great deal of training that makes her seemingly as capable as Kilwa and the others is an apprentice butler for assassins. How does she reconcile that? How did she get hired? She's definitely capable and intelligent, but assassins? Surely this family of sociopaths understand that the capacity for empathy and care is a serious issue when it comes to protection, that it's exploitable. Regardless, Gon and Kilwa have a very clever way of getting under the skins of anyone with a capacity for emotion, and that reaction is not lost on me, nor should it be lost on you at this point. People see the children as naive and ignorant. Neither is, and both are very blatantly shown not to be. Shut up, dog. No, you shut up. No, you shut I'm not talking to myself. Neither is, and both are very blatantly shown not to be. Kilwa allowing Miruki? <laughs> Kilwa allowing M Miruki? Are we going into a Dragon Ball style naming convention here? Anyway, Kilwa allowing Miruki to whip him. <laughs> Whipped Miruki. Anyway. Kilwa allowing Miruki to whip him as an apology for stabbing him is a fascinating way to do things. It acknowledges that Miruki has emotional needs, it acknowledges Miruki's desire to harm, and it also acknowledges the social expectations of the house. He hands himself to his abused and abusive mother as payment for what his family perceive as wrongdoing, but just as easily just leaves. We see this helpless kid being abused, but by this point we know to just wait to see his eyes. Like Gon, we know to just let it happen. Happen. This, in essence, is Kilwa's personal final phase of the exam. Speaking of abuse, let's discuss Kilwa's mother and sister for a moment. She seems to care so much for him, but only in a strange and twisted way. The fact that she was stabbed has been a story point since Kilwa first described his family. Seeing her fully interacting with him and his friends gives us a really clear insight into the world Kilwa was raised in, even though it doesn't give us a particular understanding of why he stabbed her. The behaviors that happen in their family, stringing a boy up by his arms and whipping him till he bleeds, is an awful family practice, but one that Kilwa and the rest of his family seem to think is commonplace and expected. It seems odd to think that his mother would truly believe that she has him under her control physically. She knows his skill set for the most part, and even if she didn't before he left, whether she's an assassin herself or not, she lives around them and knows the techniques he could employ. It remains to be seen whether the bandages and the technology she wears on her head are due to the damage Kilwa inflicted. I suspect they are, and the lack of oddity in how they carry themselves show that Kilwa is used to this side of his family. Who can blame a boy for stabbing a woman who's all too happy to have him strung up in a dungeon and whipped by his brother. And to be sure, those eyes scare his mother, they please his father, and they fascinate me because they soften when they see Gon. There's something very concerning about Gon and Kilwa together in a way that is less concerning for Gon, Kilwa, and Canary. I'm kind of interested in the idea of maybe Gon and Kilwa wearing uh, some Chippendale outfits. Not Chippendale. Tails. I'd love to see them in tails. That is a tangent that is unnecessary. Anyway, it'll be exciting when Kurapika learns about where Canary's from, since she mentioned that the wasteland she was raised in was the birthplace of the Phantom Troop. Those shadowy figures Kurapika's pretty eyes go all red for. The fact that there is such a link there is a hefty note of, by the way, this is the next place we're going on the ride, so be prepared. It was only briefly mentioned and briefly called to, and the idea that this young, sweet, dangerous new character may have learned her skills from and be involved with the crew 
Kurapika has dedicated his life to hunting down is an enjoyable one. It says a lot that one of the most emotionally normative people we've come across so far has a direct tie to those who committed such atrocities. The fact that she throws away the reference interests me more. It's basically a bookmark saying, yeah, don't worry about it. We're going to make mention of it later and we're going to visit this wasteland. She told Kilwa she would show him around when he went. Perhaps it's time for them to go now that Kilwa is free to do what he wants until he becomes the white tiger assassin lord his father dreams he will be. And so are you. Go be that white tiger assassin lord of your dreams because that's it from me. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, like, share, subscribe and comment to tell me how much you love Hisoka even though he wasn't in this episode at all. Finally, please comment with your thoughts on episodes 23 and 24 of Hunter Hunter. This has been the New World Review and I'll see you next time.